Well, today I have a chance to talk about a subject like I covered in part a similar subject in the Bible study. But I want to talk in the sermon today about restoration in the New Testament. Restor the concept of restoration from the New Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, in, in the previous Bible study, we talked about the concept of restoration. We talked about that from the Old Testament time. And, of course, there was a lot of examples of that. So let's turn over to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 8. The concept is the biblical pattern of prophecy is generally calamity comes first and then restoration. Calamity comes first, then restoration. And that's true about the, the Feast of Trumpets, and that's true about the book of Revelation. And quite frankly, I'm not going to read a lot about the calamity. I wasn't going to read much anyway, but quite frankly, I'm just not in the mood to read about it. I want to, I want to read about the good stuff, but uh, I, I am going to make reference to it to make a point. But in Revelation chapter 8, it, I'm not going to read through all the details of it, but chapter 8, verse 1 said, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about an, half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So the seventh seal is a collection of the seven trumpets. You know, that's, a lot of people know that. Uh, a lot of people remember studying that. And if, if you've been in our congregation newer for the last number of years, we don't hit prophecy as hard as some other congregations. That's by design. Uh, I'm, more, I'm more interested in Christian living. I'm more interested in what are we going to do about our lives. You know, in other words, we can read about all the things that are going to happen, and it comes back down to a, a, what kind of parent are we going to be, what kind of father are we going to be, what kind of neighbor are we going to be. So there are many people who can take a test on they knew exactly what each of us trumpets is and they can all the minutiae and all the details and there's nothing wrong with studying things but i would encourage you if you study those things please still apply christian living principles more how does this how does this affect how we're going to live i'll be honest with you as a congregation i'll be honest with our board i have friends across the country through the years who used to listen to our services a lot and used to get our dvds who have moved on to some other independent groups and these are friends of mine, but the reason why they moved on to other independent groups is I don't talk about prophecy as much as they like. And like some of, the, some of my friends will have these prophecy sermons and, and they'll go through all the details, they'll have graphics, and that's fine. But see, my approach is more Christian living. Yes, people may pass a test on exactly what happens in each of those seals, etc., but maybe, may, maybe they're not really living the life they should be living. So, and they're still my friends. Uh, they're, you know, we're not. I'm not mad about it. I, I'd be honest. Sometimes I shake my head and I think, really, do you want that stuff? But, but again, they're my friends and they can like what they like. And actually, what I really believe is, after a while, they'll get a little tired of that, and maybe even come back to more of our Christian living style. But that's. It's, they're still my friends, whether they like the prophecy stuff or not. I like prophecy, but I like prophecy to how it makes us change our lives. Because if it doesn't change our lives, I don't. It, it can be a vanity thing. It can be an intellectual thing. It can be feeling better than other people. So again, I don't mind when our preachers talk about prophecy, but I like that our guys talk about more Christian living, how it ties into that. I really appreciate that. But so again, without going into the details, the seventh seal is a listing of seven trumpets. Verses seven through twelve talks about the first four trumpets. And I know my little New King James Bible talks about the, the subheads in there, tells what the, each trumpet is. I'm not even going to read what the, they are. You can read them. I'm just not in the mood to talk about negative things like that. But I do want to look at verse 13. And I looked indeed, I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of their angels who are about to sound. So obviously, whoa, that's, a, that's, that's get your attention. Whoa, this is, this is serious stuff. You know, so here, I want you to know the fifth trumpet is called the first woe. And the fifth trumpet is chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. I'm not even going to read what it is. I think it's great for you to read because you study your Bibles. You can read what it is. But I want you to know the fifth trumpet is called the first woe. And then in chapter 9, verses 13 through 21, the sixth trumpet is called the second woe. And again, I'm not going to read what it is. You can study. You, you can know it. 
And again, I encourage you, if you do study these things, apply it to Christian living principles. How is it going to change what you do, what you think, what you say, how you spend your time? That, to me, is more important than just being an expert in all the minutia. But then we get to chapter 11, verse 14. Chapter 11, verse 14. Remember I said that these trumpets 5, 6, and 7 are woes. And so the seventh trumpet is called the third woe. Let's look at this here. Revelation 11, verse 14. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. The third woe is the seventh trumpet. Now you sit there, you know this, you're Bible students. You know the, the seventh trumpet can be called a woe, but it's also very special. It's very positive as well. And that's the point we're making in this presentation and other presentations. That with, like the Feast of Trumpets, there comes calamity and restoration. With prophecy, there comes bad news and good news. And I have on the hand out there, I'd like you to think about this a second. I'd like to pose these questions to you. You know, the Feast of Trumpets pictures a combination of calamity, some really horrible events happening. And there, there are horrible events happening around us. We're not ignorant of it. We, we're very much aware of it. But there's also many promises with, in the Bible for believers, even associated with these days. We look at those promises for restoration. But ask these two questions, first of all, to you, for you, how you live your life, to analyze yourself. Are you more personally motivated by the calamity? Or are you more personally motivated by the re restoration? I'm asking you to analyze yourself. It was brought up in the interactive Bible study. I think Dixon brought it up he, when he first came into the church, because I'm going to include me in this. The first booklet I ever got from a church, a church of God, was a book entitled 1975 and Prophecy. And it had a lot of pictures by Basil Wolverton, who used to very graphically wrote for Mad Magazine. He was really, really good. And he made these graphical things. And, of course, I was young at the time, so I was impressionable. I was a teenager. But here I have to say my first contact with a lot of biblical information was a little bit of, a little bit of fear. It got my attention what was going to happen. Now, that, he, he had the same, a similar experience, as did I, and many of you did as well. So my first contact with literature from a church of God that I was get, becoming a part of was more of focusing in on the negative. Now, still, I would say that as I focused in on the negative, it was going to change my life, but it was going to change my life because I didn't want that to happen to me. But that didn't last long. That was just a short period of time. And through the years, I can say, for me personally, I'm more motivated by the restoration than I am by the calamity. I'm more, I'm more impressed by grace than I am the threat of punishment. And again, if I look at, we talked about parenting. In parenting, good parents want to spend a lot of time promoting blessings, promoting good ways of living and righteousness, knowing that you sometimes have to mention consequences. Sometimes there are consequences. Good parents do that. And I believe God deals with us that way. And I guess I'm hoping you, because I can't answer for you, I can't speak for you, but I hope you're more personally motivated by the restoration than you are by the calamity. I hope that you're more, you do things not because you're afraid of not doing it, I hope you're not afraid of God. I hope you're not doing it because you're afraid of disappointing him. I hope it's more because you have a relationship with him. You know his love. You accept his love. You accept his premise of what he's trying to do for you. You accept the vision of life for you, the life for man, all of mankind. And I hope that is your greater motivation and not the motivation of, uh-oh, I don't want that calamity to happen to me. I hope your life is that you don't rob a bank because you just don't think that's the thing to do as opposed to you don't want to go to jail. If you're avoiding robbing a bank because you don't want to go to jail, you do have a lust problem that you need help with. But I don't think that's the case for probably anybody in this room. I don't, I don't think you're sitting there avoiding adultery 
because you're afraid of consequences, I think you're really realizing that how God created people to be and how God created relationships to be. And, and I'd like to think that those positive teachings motivate you more than being afraid. You see what I'm saying? I, I hope that you're personally motivated by the restoration than you are motivated by the calamity. Now, that was asking what you think personally. Now, I want to ask the, the next two questions about how you deal with other people. Do you seek to motivate other people by the calamity, or do you seek to motivate the other people by the restoration? In other words, when you try to help people, are you pointing out to them how they could get in trouble and how, they, how bad things can really come down on their head, and you're warning them to save them from this? It's, okay, it's kind of like and people do this. Every once in a while you see people with placards and signs on a street corner warning people not to go to hell, what their vision of hell is. And I haven't seen the guy for a while, but there's a guy in Longview, he wears all white, and he stands out there, and he not only has a sign, but he'll yap at you. And even if, you don't, even if no one's listening, he'll just be talking away. And if, if, I don't want to roll my window down because I don't want him to think I'm going to give him any money. But on the other hand, sometimes I like just to hear what he's saying. He, just, he, talks, he talks faster than I talk for a lot longer than I talk in the hot sun. He just talks away. But he and his vision, this is he, he makes the choice. He wants to motivate people by warning them about the calamity and warning them about the consequences. So you can say, well, Dave, he does it. Can I do that? Yes, you can do that. I'm hoping that's not your approach. I'm not saying something bad's going to happen to you. If that is, I will say this. If that's your approach, if you're always pointing calamity out to people, you will turn people off. You will have a very short ministry with that person. Now, you may have that ministry. You like to point out calamity all the time, but people will turn away from you. They won't want to hear it. Now, there'll be some people who will like hearing it, but other people will be like, I, I don't want to hear that. And so you may have a ministry going because you talk to a lot of people, volume of people, but you will probably not have a long-lasting relationship with a lot of people if you're always warning them about something. I mean, there's, Jesus finally warned. By the way, remember I tried to teach you. My, try to, my impression is Jesus had a relationship ministry. For the longest time, he didn't warn. For the longest time, he fed them. He cast demons out. He healed them. He comforted them. And finally, in Matthew 23, he started warning them. We call them white and sepulchers. That's warning. And you know what happened when he started warning people? They killed him. Stephen warned them, and they killed him. When Paul warned certain cities, they threw him out of the city. So I'm just saying, if you choose a warning ministry, if you're the kind who likes to point out the calamity, that's your choice, but understand there's going to be reactions to you having a more of a calamity ministry. That's your choice. I would recommend you have more of a restoration ministry, that you help people move forward. Again, yes, sometimes mentioning calamity can help them see the light, and they may make some adjustments, and maybe there's probably like in parenting, there's a time and place. But I would like to encourage you, in my opinion, as your friend, I would like to encourage you to try to motivate people through restoration and not motivate people through criticism or berating or showing them where they're wrong or pointing out their flaws. That's your choice, but I'm, I'm, I would like you to consider having more of a ministry of motivating people toward a restoration. Now, I, I read from Revelation 11:14 that the second woe okay let's go back to revelation eleven fourteen. the second woe was passed behold the third woe is coming the third woe is not just a woe it's also very glorious it's also picturing the return of christ look at verse 15 then the seventh angel sounded the seventh angel which was called a woe but it's also called something positive the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, in fact, if, if I say the words, if I just read the words, some of you are going to hear the song from Handel's Messiah. You're going to hear it because you've heard it over and over and over again. These beautiful words were put to that beautiful music. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. 
they do it a little better than that, but maybe a lot better than that. But you can hear it, can't you? Those beautiful words. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So that seventh trump, which is considered partially a woe, is also the best news of all, the greatest news of all. And that's what I'm saying. Calamity and restoration. Do you focus on the calamity or do you focus on the restoration? Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Gathering up the elect. Again, I don't believe there's one specific place of safety. As many churches have taught through the years, and some probably still teach, and there's probably a few of you who think there is just one place of safety. You and I would just have a difference of opinion of that. I believe that God will protect his people wherever they are under his wings. He will shelter them. And in, in this case, it says they'll be gathered from the four ends of the earth, which would seem to indicate to me that they're not all in one place, that they are certain. But again, that, that, that doesn't, that's not absolute proof, by the way. I'm just telling you how it strikes me. But when the trumpet sounds, people will be gathered from their different pockets of where they're going to be. And if, if God has chosen to protect everyone in one place, I don't believe that, but he'll, he'll do what he wants to do. And I respect your right to believe that if that's what you believe. But the trumpet will sound, he'll gather them up. And that's going to be an amazing time. I won't read all the scriptures. We are going to be amazed who's going to be in the first resurrection. We're going to be amazed. We're going to be shocked. And we're, we're going to be shocked because we're going to, we have our own criteria of how we think who's going to be there. And I don't think it's absolutely going to be the exact same as God's because I don't think any of us has it exactly as God figures it out. Now, I'm not, I'm, you say, Dave, are you trying to put people in the resurrection who shouldn't be there? I, am, I don't put anyone in that resurrection. God does that. And I'm just saying I'm going to accept whoever he has in that resurrection. I'm just going to accept it. I mean, I'm not going to say, you, hey, you can't be there. You're a counterfeit. I can't say that. If, if God has him in the resurrection, I'm going to be happy about that. We're not going to be saying, well, the, concerning this Doctrine over here, you didn't know enough about that doctrine. You can't be in the first resurrection. Really? So we're going we're gonna to tell God who he's going to put in the resurrection? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ was the first fruit, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. When he returns, he's going to raise the first fruits. And when he raises them, you know, he's going to know who his first fruits are. He knows who he's given his spirit to, God's spirit to. He knows who he has a relationship with. He knows who, who have been called. And someone can say, well, Dave, you, how much time do you spend trying to figure out who is, who, which people are in the true church? I don't spend any second worrying about that. I don't think about that. I don't care about that at all. You might say, what, would you think that person? I don't, it's not my place. First of all, I, I, I like the scripture in, in 2 Timothy 2, 19, I think it is. I like that scripture. It says the Lord knows those who are his. And then it says those, if you, if you name Christ, depart from iniquity. I name Christ. My responsibility is departing from iniquity. My responsibility is not trying to figure out who's in the real church. Someone would say, what do you think when you hear people say they're the only true church? Well, I'm telling you, I speak honestly to you. Sometimes I laugh, you know, I laugh like they really say that. And sometimes I, I try not to, especially if someone's serious. I try not to laugh in their face. I really don't want to do that. That's rude, to laugh in their face. But when they start saying they know exactly who's in their true church, I try to be, okay, this is not a good thing. I won't laugh in their face. That's rude of me. That would be wrong of me. I don't want to do that. And sometimes I, sometimes I feel sorry for them, thinking they really believe that. My wife and I were talking the other day. We were watching an individual in one of the churches of God, actually one of the churches of God in East Texas. And this person was acting really, really elitist. And I, I was telling my wife about it. And my wife kind of shook her head. She goes, you know, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, they're elitist. 
and they're elitists with a lot of money, and they're elitists with a lot of power, and this little lady down here thinks she's an elitist, and she's not anywhere close to their lifestyle, to their station in life, but in her little world, because she's in the right church, she's an elitist. So in one sense, she thinks like those politicians think, but from afar, you're looking at it and think, how can you even compare this little lady to them? Having the same challenge, having the same problem, thinking they're an elitist, thinking they're better than everybody else. And it's like, again, of course, there's no way I'm going to be able to reach her. I mean, not, in this, not now. If God ever opens a door, I would try to help her. But I'm, but I'm going to stay out of it, stay out of her way. Uh, she, she just her little elitist. And, and the thing is, I don't want to be that, and I don't want you to be that. As your friend, I, I don't want you to be an elitist thinking, well, we're the special ones. We're the only ones. We're better than everyone else. Uh, if, if you just sit back and look at that type of thinking, that's so contrary to the way of Jesus Christ. It's so contrary to the way his approach is. But yet you say, well, I know many churches, sure many churches do that. Inside the church of God and outside the church of God, many churches do that. It's just something that plays on people feeling special, plays on something, and again, if you have a relationship with Christ, you, you probably view that as a special thing, but it's not a special thing to receive, it's a special thing to give and to serve. I really like what Lenny Cascio said in this sermon. I like a lot of things Lenny Cascio said. Uh, I was talking to Ron Avey about this uh, either before church or during the break, I can't remember when, but Lenny made the statement he, he likened that big church a big church in Kansas City area, over actually in, over in, uh, I think it was over in, uh, over, look, over something over in uh, Kansas. But the way they said was, they said it this way. If you want to be served, if you want to come to our church service and be served, he said, don't join. Just come and be served. But if you want to join our church, you're going to work. And he, he mentioned that, that approach was that congregation, and a lot of people like that because a lot of people like to get involved. It's kind of reminded me of JFK. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. So really, when you watch people come to church and all of us do our little things, we all pitch in and help out. Again, by the way, if any of you want to come and just be served, that's okay. We're happy. We, we have to serve somebody. So we, you know, come, and, come and be served. We're happy to serve you. But we do, we do value the relationship of people who jump in, making the food, cleaning the building, all the different things people do to be a part of a team that we work together. And again, so it, that's, that statement was not made to scare anyone away. We're just, I really like what Lenny said about that. I thought it was really good because it's like, okay, we're going to try our best to participate and serve and love because when you serve and love, you're doing a lot of things. You're doing a lot of good things. Over in verse 51, verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So again, all the bad news about the day of the Lord, all that bad news coming, and yet the great news is we get people get changed to a new life. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. You know the words. It's going to be very encouraging because we've watched brothers and sisters in Christ pass on. We have, we've had people here, for those of you who don't know, who have come later, and those on the internet, We've had pillars in this congregation who were here when we started back in 1995, when this congregation formed as a congregation. We've had pillars who helped build this congregation, people who've uh, donated their time, donated their money, donated their, their life to help get this congregation started. And many of them have just gotten older and have passed on. And it would be so great to see them again in the, in the resurrection. It would be so great to see them in the kingdom. We, we look at a time when it says... 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. Some people who helped build this building, some people who put a lot of time in serving the community, serving each other. Then those who are alive and remain, and I used to, I was almost, would have bet money that I would be one of those who are alive and remain, but I, don't, I mean, I don't know what the odds are on that. I mean, I, I, I have no control over it anyway. I just, I mean, I, I have control over good or bad decisions, but uh, I, I would have told you years ago that I'm definitely going to be one of those who are alive and remain, but I don't know. I don't know. I just, I, we'll just have to see. I'll tell you what, uh, eternal sleep, or not eternal sleep, but a period of sleep sounds pretty good, I have to admit that. <laughs> a little bit of rest sounds pretty good. I, I kind of feel like the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians, I think it's Philippians 1, 22, 23. Uh, for me to pass on, Paul said, is better for him, but to be alive is better for others. And I, I, I like staying alive for my wife and for my kids and my grandkids and my friends and you. But as far as if, if I were to pass on, don't cry for me. That, that just means I'd be awaiting the resurrection. There'd be nothing wrong with that. And you'd miss my crazy humor. You'd miss it. Because <laughs> you have to have something to denounce. You have to, you have to have some role model to look at and say, I don't want to be like that. But, I mean, you're, I'm, just, I'm just talking about me. I'm talking about you, too. You know? Some are going to pass on first, and they will rise first. But those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the air and to always be with the Lord. And verse 18 says to comfort one another with these words. So again, to me, the, the message of the day of the Lord, yes, it has all that bad, but I'd, I'd like to focus on the comforting part, on the, on the good part. I, I, I'm not going to, this is in my notes. Let's go back to Amos chapter 5, verse 18. The thing about what happens here in these messages right before the feast, see, I'm in the process of preparing my feast messages. And sometimes when I prepare my feast messages, I give it early because it, cons it consumes my mind. Whatever I'm, whatever's on my mind is what I like to talk about. So I, th I may cover this at the feast. I may not. We'll see. I'm still bouncing a lot of ideas around as I'm trying to nail those down this week. But it ties into this time of the year, Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. And it ties into this concept of, of restoration. Matthew 5, 18 says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Now again, we would say, think that through. If you're desiring the restoration, that's a good thing, okay? That's nothing wrong with that. So obviously, if he's saying, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, if, you get, if you're getting consumed with the negative things about it, if you're getting consumed with all the minutia, if that's consuming your mind, that, there's too much emphasis on that. Don't, don't have so much emphasis on that. Emphasize what you can do in your life. Emphasize on how you can reflect the Lord, how you can show his way of life. It talks about, he mentions verses continuing on 18 through 20, that the day of the Lord is going to be a time of darkness. It's going to be pretty tough. But I want you to consider verse 21. This is the same thing that Isaiah said, or that God quoted Isaiah saying in Isaiah chapter 1. Look at, look at Amos 5, verse 21. I hate, I despise your feast days. I don't like your assemblies. I don't like your burnt offerings. Now, a lot of people take that as fake days that they weren't God's days, they were fake days. Okay, certainly if they were fake days, God would not like the fake days. But let's assume for a second that he's talking about his real days. I do not believe he's doing away with the feast days at all. But he's something about their keeping the feast days, he's not liking. He's not liking. And I know we, many of us talk about this, I know Reg and I talk about this regularly, we, well, usually at this time of the year we talk about it. Here we've got all these Church of God folks going away to keep the Feast of Tabernacles a time of peace and getting along. Now what is wrong with that picture when we all go talking about feast and getting along and watching how little the churches of God get along? It's quite despicable. And I think that's what God's looking at. God's saying, I'm happy you're all going to the feast. I'm happy you're all picturing the millennium. I'm happy you're picturing all those good times. 
hey, folks, uh, how about doing it now? How about doing it with each other now? How about doing it on a regular basis now? Because he's saying, you know, look, I hate, I, I, I despise your feast days. I do not savor your sac sacred assemblies. Even though you offer me burnt offerings, you give me grain offerings, I won't accept them. I don't regard them. Take away the noise of your songs. Your beautiful singing, I don't, I don't even want to hear your beautiful hymns and your beautiful special music. Yes, that's all nice and good, but you know you're all missing something that would make these days better. In verse 24 he says, Let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. And I think verse 24 is what he's talking about. He's not saying don't keep the feast. He's saying, you know, keep the feast, but how about keeping it in a good way? How about having some justice in the way you live? How about having some righteousness in the way you live? And, and you're getting the drift what I'm saying here? We focus on our behavior. That's when I said I, I'm more interested in, instead of being an expert in all the minutia about the prophecy, is any of this helping us to be a better person today? It should. And Isaiah says the same thing. Isaiah's account, he said, I don't, want to, I don't want you to come at my feast days because, he said, you've got blood on your hands. So he wasn't doing away with the feast days. He was saying is, keep the feast days, but get rid of the blood on your hands. Keep the feast days, but quit doing a lack of justice. Quit doing a, a, a lack of righteousness. And so I would hope then that as we, every Sabbath and every feast day, as we hear the messages, the messages which sometimes involve calamity and restoration, let's not focus on the bad, of how, either how much we know about it or how much we can portray others to change others. Let's try to find ways how we can picture the restoration. Can we be tools of righteousness to picture the restoration every Sabbath, every day of the week, the feast days we travel to to worship together and, and, and relax together and sing together and fellowship together and eat together and just picture the time of good times. Hopefully then that can carry on to our every day of life because I think that's what God's interested in. So again, we understand the calamity, read the calamity, understand it, but please focus on the restoration in the New Testament.